Hi, welcome to Taming Feral Kittens and Cats. I'm Mike Phillips, president and co-founder of Urban Cat League, and this is the full-length workshop version of a presentation we've been doing for over 20 years. Our older video, the short version, was Tough Love Socializing Feral Kittens for Adoption. But in this version, we go into much, much greater detail, and we even work with some adult cats and much older kittens. And I like to call it Smarter Love for Tougher Cats. Taming the feral kittens in a large outdoor colony can help bring you to 100% TNR, improve the community relations, and free up more resources to take care of the existing colony. But also in a hoarding situation, many times there are many under-socialized cats and kittens, and this presentation will help with that. In New York City, we have a unique situation where a feral cat will appear seemingly out of nowhere in the middle of a business district without an alleyway or a vacant lot within a quarter of a mile. Uh, these cats presumably come up from the basements of businesses where they were a mouser and often were called in to socialize a litter of feral kittens that was born in a basement to one of these mousers that wasn't neutered and they have absolutely no comfort level with humans. So feral cats come from a number of sources and sometimes there is no TNR option. There is no colony to where they could be returned and the only option is to socialize them in hopes that they will feel comfortable living in a situation around humans. We're gonna show you all the techniques we've used and how it has often turned out very well. The first encounter you have with those feral kittens, you want it to be expedient and calm uh, you don't want to be chasing down feral kittens in, in a vacant lot, grabbing them, throwing them in carriers. Not if you hope to socialize them for adoption because you might get bitten and scratched, but much worse than that, they'll be terrified of you and you will be starting you know, from a negative uh, to try and gain their trust and calm them down for any kind of socialization. So we have a video on YouTube. If We're not going to talk about this at all today. But there's a real science to trapping feral kittens in a way that's conducive to socializing them. So if you want to look for this on our YouTube channel, that's on there too. If Urban Cat League, as I explained, we started having to socialize kittens that normally might have been put back, returned to a feral cat colony. Because we had been told, oh, no, 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 the past eight weeks, forget about it, just TNR them, put them back, it's way too much trouble. So by trial and error, we self-taught ourselves to socialize these older three and four and sometimes even five month, six month old kittens because we had no choice. We had nowhere to put them. There was no colony to put them back to. And we found that this eight week rule just wasn't true. So in this workshop, we're gonna offer you everything we've learned in the last 20 years about taming feral kittens and cats. We're gonna start with the young ones, six to seven weeks old, which are so very easy to tame. And then we'll move on. We'll show you how to approach taming the kittens that are eight weeks and older and how to handle them when they come in off the street, literally climbing the walls, uh, and you need to calm them down before you can do any work. We will show how we tamed a couple of adult feral cats. Uh, this is mostly to be helpful so that that one cat in your backyard that you'd like to make more comfortable with you and maybe coax indoors for the cold winter months, uh, how you might be able to do that. But it's not a suggestion that you should start a program to try and tame adult feral cats for adoption. That's not realistic, and most adult feral cats cannot be tamed for adoption. Although it's been my experience to see uh, dozens of uh, adult feral cats, under socialized cats, become comfortable living indoors among humans. It's a highly individualized and labor-intensive project, which we never entered into with a rigid result-oriented approach. Our goal with this workshop is to offer you the tools that will enable you to socialize a litter of feral kittens, or perhaps socialize an older cat who has no TNR option, who cannot be relocated, and you've decided that their best option is to live indoors among humans. I hope you'll watch the entire workshop because up until the very end, there's new information about how the techniques can be applied in different situations and how they overlap and how to apply them with different ages of cats. I like to say, it irritates some people, but I like to say cats tame themselves. We can do nothing to change the way they think about us. They have to change their mind. The only thing we can do is set up circumstances so that we open a door and they go, you know what? It's in my best interest that I 
come near this person and we create a situation where they come to us by choice. The Urban Cat League Taming Approach, we try and disarm the cat's fight or flight or freeze response. We're going to go into that in detail later. But with our technique, there's no risk of injury to human or cat. It's not invasive. We don't wrap them in a towel. We don't burrito them. We don't restrain them or confine them in any way. And the cat may retreat at all times. They may be in a small space, in a small bathroom, or you'll see me inside a Great Dane pen with some uh, litter of kittens. But they always have three or four feet at least, um, preferably six to eight feet, to stay away from you when you're socializing them. And then we just wait until we provide an, a strong enough incentive that by choice they start to come to us. We find that if they make the choice, that's permanent and it, we can build on that. The things we use to get them to come to us, we call them the disarming incentives, food, interactive play, and then sometimes attraction to another cat. Those are the three things we work with. Also the three variables for socialization. They're just pointers and suggestions. There's no hard, fast rules, but if someone delivers a litter of kittens to you, with the information I'm going to give you today, you're going to give a kind of a, an idea of, okay, well, we've got this and we've got that. So this is probably our expectation to be able to socialize these kittens. Age, gender, nature, nurture, which is genetics or the life experience they had before they came to you. And these are the factors that influence that fight or flight intensity, which is going to kind of predict how successful you'll be. I use the terms uh, tame or socialize interchangeably. I understand they have very precise definitions. We're not taming wild animals. We're not breaking a horse so that it'll allow us to ride it and submit to us. We're trying to uh, bring a cat to a comfort level with humans. But I just use those terms interchangeably. Years ago, we made a video entitled Socializing Feral Kittens for Adoption, and we were told nobody saw it because we used the word socializing, and everybody was searching with the word tame. So this time around, we switched it up a little bit. Also, you know, the terms feral, under-socialized, wild, fractious, they really can be misleading. I don't like to reduce a cat to a one-word description. Uh, just because a cat's born outdoors doesn't make it feral. Just because it's born indoors doesn't mean it is socialized to humans. So let's just dispense with all of that. And I hope you'll get the message, which is we're trying to bring a cat to its optimal level of comfort with humans. And so that you'll be able to find the human being that is willing to accept the cat on those terms. It may be a very fractious cat, but with a very tolerant adopter who understands that mentality and can work with the cat very, very well. Or you can bring a cat to a very high level of comfort with humans, and then you can just pretty much adopt it to anybody. But let's just move from there, and I don't mean to confuse anybody by my interchanging of the terms. Here we have the three-month-old kittens. Now this is after about a week. They're relatively calm with me there in the pen but you see they're very agitated. But this is when they first came off. When they first came off the street, they were put in the pen. Um, actually, you see a spay scar. We did spay them first because we had a spay appointment and you never pass up a spay appointment. So we did them first. But you see how agitated they are, uh, even um, as compared to the young kittens. Now, when they come in off the street, I call it the cooling off period. And even the most ingrained feral adult, uh, after about 48 hours, they kind of calm down, they're confined, they're not happy about it, but they kind of go, okay, here we are. They stop trying to escape, they stop jumping and climbing the walls every time you come in the room. Uh, this is the period you need to let them calm down before you start any taming. I give them a free ride. If they'll eat with you, like the young kittens, after 15 minutes, they would eat with me right there. That's great. But the older kittens, a lot of times, they are too terrified to even eat in the room with you. With you, with you six feet away and they have the plate of food with them, you give them a free ride for a couple of days and um, then you want to be in the room with them as much as possible. Just sit there, spending time with them, getting them used to being with you. And then they're eating that food with you in the room. And then at each meal, you're going to inch it a little closer, one inch, two inches, six inches. It might take them each time another 10 minutes, another 15 minutes to think, okay, I guess he's not going anywhere. We're really hungry. 
Okay, let's step six inches closer to him and we'll eat that food. This sequence you've been looking at, of course, is uh, much older cats. These are not kittens. These are adult feral cats. Um, but we're going to take this in reverse order. I'm going to kind of show you how long it takes. Uh, this took about three months to uh, the progression you just watched of from all the way back at the end of that corridor to bring the cat all the way up. And uh, what helped with these older cats was some uh, treats. The cat got her, I rolled the treats to her and she got more interested in the treats. And then gradually she would come up uh, to see um, uh, if she would have the food right near me. And uh, the next, uh, we're gonna look at some three and four month old kittens and uh, it goes much more quickly with them. You'll see that in a week and a half, I got them to come up and I could uh, put my hand on the plate. And last of all, we're gonna look at some six week old kittens and you'll see how really quickly within almost an hour, um, we've got them perfectly relaxed eating with me right there nearby. Now, this gets brighter in a second as I zoom in. I wanted to show you how far away from them I am, about six or eight feet away. And this is about a week and a half working the three and four month, the three month old kittens. There are three of them. They're eating right away comfortably with me. I put the food down. They're perfectly fine. But you see that girl staring at the camera. She's four months old. And she still, after a week and a half, needs several minutes. It takes her about 15 minutes to calm down. I guess he's not going away. And then she will eat all that far away. She will eat the food. So what I said is, you know, we inching the plate closer and closer. And after about a week and a half, I've got the three month olds. They're coming up close, close to me. I've been spending an hour in the morning, an hour in the, in the evening and uh, at two meals a day, keeping them hungry in between and they will come close. So the next thing I'm going to do, just put my hand on the plate. They've, I've done this before, so they don't go running away. The first time you put your hand on the plate, they'll run away. But these guys have gotten used to that. And I've even got to a point where at uh, one and a half weeks, I've got the plate really only about a foot away from me. And they will come um, after a little bit of time, they will come up and they'll start eating on the plate near me. Uh, they're not afraid of me anymore, the three month olds. They know I'm not gonna hurt them. They wish I'd just go away and let them eat their food in peace, but they're willing because they're hungry, they're willing. So now I'm thinking, okay, they're eating right next to me. I've got to start petting them at some point. So I got to get them used to my hand coming at them. So get some food. They, oh, they're really interested in the food, but hey, I don't want your hand. So they won't, they run away. Like, oh, I don't want anything to do with that hand coming at me, but they are very interested in the food. Now here you see those six week old kittens. We had trapped them only an hour and a half before. They're agitated, they're, they're nervous. They're, they're not quite sure what's going on but they're not freaked out like those three and four month olds when that you saw climbing the bars of the pen. They're looking at me, they smell the food. They're not that crazy about this two-legged giant coming toward them. You see them backing up and you'll, you can kind of, even at this point, you'll know who your tougher customers are gonna be. The braver ones are to the front and the ones that push themselves all the way back as far as possible away from you you know already they're going to be the ones you're going to have to win over. But what I want you to start noticing is these six week old kittens, they don't have the panic. Look at the little gray guy. He says, that food looks good. Let me try it. And then he realizes, oh, nobody else is going for it. Maybe I should sit back. Maybe there's something going on here that I shouldn't, uh, shouldn't, uh, you know, try. But then the brave one who's closest to me, He's like thinking, okay, well, here we are. This is kind of weird, but hey, I'm hungry. So he goes to start eating. Uh, at six weeks, they make these choices very quickly. They don't have as much of the fight or flight instinct. So although they're a little bit afraid, they kind of go, well, okay, here we are. And then they'll start eating. But you see the one who pushed herself all the way to the back, she's female. And even at this young age, she had a little bit more fight or flight instinct than the boys, but it only took her about a half an hour to calm down. And then she had the same braveness that they had. And she goes, well, okay, here we are. Let's, um, let's go with the program. So what is causing this hesitation? It's a fight or flight or freeze response. 
Now, what that is, is when a cat is stressed, there is a release of corticosteroids in the body and that causes a neurochemical reaction which says, get out of there, run, go. And if they can't get away, they turn around and they fight for their lives. They don't know what's going on. They can't imagine why you put them in this trap and why they're confined. Cats have a really strong sense of confinement that really freaks them out when they, when they can't just run away. Uh, if they're really overwhelmed by the predator and they're, they're terrified and they think, okay, I'm a goner, they just freeze. And that's when you see them where they won't even look at you. They're looking at the wall. They, they literally, when the fight or flight or freeze response is engaged, they literally cannot make social eye contact. It's physically impossible. So our job is to break through this, calm them down in a way so they can start make some, making some choices out of self-interest to come to us, which they literally cannot do when this response is engaged. This response serves them very well in nature. Um, if they aren't part of a feral colony where they get fed every day and they're out hunting for their meals, this fight or flight uh, response serves them well because they are both prey and predator. So while they're out looking for lunch, they have to make sure they don't become somebody else's lunch. So they're always looking over their shoulder. They're very alert and it serves them well in nature. Until they're eight weeks old, mom is the security guard. She totally protects them. They don't need this fight or flight response. In fact, it doesn't even exist until about four weeks old. It starts to come in at about four weeks old, not coincidentally, at the same time that they start crawling around and they're moving. And they could potentially, you know, maybe get away from a predator at four or five weeks. They could start crawling away and they actually have a little stress. Up until that, they have no stress. Mom will take care of it. She protects that litter and it's her full responsibility. We went looking for these little guys after we trapped a female and saw that she was lactating. They were in a crawl space four weeks old. They'd never seen a human being. So we just walked right over and picked them up. And it's as if their fight or flight instinct kicked in right at that moment for the first time in their lives. This isn't the way it normally works. But fortunately, um, they went right to eating uh, solid food. We were able to keep them with their mother for another week and it all worked out okay. This is an example of a cat with the freeze response from the fight or flight or freeze response. She's a 10 year old female cat from an outdoor feral colony. And we just brought her in to renew her rabies vaccination and have her checked up at the vet. And she is completely shut down. I don't want to torture her too much here, but I just wanted to show you that this does not mean that she's tame. She's completely terrified and she feels cornered. She's in a pen and she knows she can't get out. So she's just completely frozen. If we gave her an opening, she would fly out of there. But since she knows she can't escape, she's just completely shut down. These cats can come inside and live happily if absolutely necessary and there's nowhere else for them. I've had a couple live in the house. They they come out when you're not there. They get along great with the other cats. They use the litter box and they eat normally. But if a human's there, they will completely stay out of sight. But if they're cornered and they're trapped, they just become completely passive. They can be the most difficult of all to tame. I have had them come around and become friendly cats that enjoyed being petted, but it wasn't by applying the techniques and uh, encouraging them in any way. It was just giving them a free run of the house. And at one cat after seven years, he finally came out, started hanging out with the other cats, and he gradually became friendly. But it wasn't because I did a program of applying the techniques and uh, pressured him into any way to, to become socialized. He just decided to do it on his own. Before we zero in on the taming techniques for these older kittens, let's look at the variables that make taming them such a challenge. Under eight weeks, as we said, this, this response is very minimal. It's fast track taming. Uh, under eight weeks usually. With minimal uh, application of the techniques we're going to show, it works well. Between eight and 16 weeks, you definitely, we found you can definitely tame uh, feral kittens, but it's slower. And in adult cats, it's the slowest of all with adult cats when it's even possible because they have the fully ingrained uh, fight or flight instinct. So this six to eight week period of time is nature's window for really easy socializing. 
One of the factors is mom's maternal hormones are waning. The teeth and the claws that didn't bother her at all for six weeks, she was purring away with them kneading her with the, those little claws and the teeth. She was happy as a clam nursing her kittens. But now it's starting to twang her a little bit at six weeks old. Nature's telling her, teach them to hunt, send them on their merry way, and you get yourself back together for the next breeding cycle, which of course, as, as TNR people, is our nightmare when there's a cat out there that's breeding repeatedly. So she will think, okay, I got to teach them to hunt. So if she doesn't have a feeding station to trot them to for their first meal, she will trap some things of her own and she'll bring them the soft organ meats, the liver, uh, whatever, to get them a taste of this meat. And they are at the head of the class. Yes, 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 this is what we need. And they're really good students to learn to hunt at that age. Now, why are they such good students? Well, our key advantage here now, first of all, what's happening with them is they have such a rapid rate of growth that mother's milk is no longer sufficient to sustain that rate of growth. So they are craving another source of nutrition to make up for what the mother's milk doesn't offer them. That's why they're such good students and they're ready to learn to hunt. But for us, if we step in at that point, you pretty much just have to put a plate of food on the floor, sit on the floor with them, let them eat. And with those six week old kittens, you'll be petting them. They'll be in your lap you'll have them tame and ready for adoption in no time. At six weeks, it's often effortless. At this age, they've only been alive for 42 days. So every day is new to them. It's a new experience. So they're willing to accept things that an older kitten won't. You see that kitten on the fawn. He doesn't know that you're not supposed to do that. Nobody told him. And that adult cat sitting on the horse probably grew up in a stable, was around horses at six weeks old when his brain was very malleable and just said, okay, horses, they're great. Love them. These lessons they learn at this very young age last a lifetime, which is why at six weeks taming is often effortless. This second month in a kitten's life has been compared to the transition from a caterpillar to a butterfly. With feral kittens, this is our opportunity to intervene and determine pretty much whether our eight week old kitten is gonna be confident and comfortable around human beings or whether they're gonna still need a lot of socialization work and a lot more convincing before they are comfortable and happy living around human beings. At Urban Cat League, we never charge for workshops or any of our services. If you find the information helpful, we hope you'll donate. There's information at the very end of the video on how to do that. You may get away with taming those really young kittens in a cattery or not such an optimal space. But if you're in for the long haul and you're going to be taming older kittens and maybe even adult cat, you're going to want to find a location for the taming process that's going to be the most effective and give you the best result. So where are we going to tame them? The best location, once you trap them with those guidelines that we have in our video, which will make sure they're calm and ready to, to be tamed easily, is a place where they can't hide out. You want them to be able to see what you're doing. If they're under a bed hiding and you're trying to work with them, they're imagining, okay, they're boiling the water, they're sharpening the knives, we're goners. You want to have a space, you have a bed, you want to stuff pillows in any place that they can go and hide away. You want to have, they want a little space to stay away from you so they don't feel too, too, too um, closed in. The bathroom is a good place to start, a small space, because without this option to retreat, even if it's four, five, six feet, um, their natural curiosity is preempted and they're not going to try stuff. If you don't have a room that you can dedicate to a taming project, uh, you can just use a pop-up tent. You can order them on Amazon.com. Uh, here's an example of one. They're very easy to take up and put down. Uh, in the next uh, sequence, I'm going to show you how I took those kittens, those young kittens that were in the cattery, and I put them in this pop tent to continue working with them. And it, it can work very well. And I got the kittens out of that cattery, and uh, you see uh, most of them are all right there on my lap. They're perfectly comfortable eating out of the dish, but one of them was just a little shy, needed a little extra space, and just that arm's length where he could go around the corner of the carrier. That was all he needed to build his confidence and by choice when he felt he was ready to come up close.
And if he can choose and not feel like he's backed into a corner and I'm making him do something he doesn't want to do, that's all that he'll need. Without that option, they're preempted with this fight or flight response and they're not relaxed and they're not going to make any permanent progress. A good space is a place where you can get down on the floor. We want to get to a point where we can standing up our full height reach down and pick them up without them scurrying away. We want to build to that, but in the beginning, it's just too much. So you want to be able to sit down on the floor with them. A small bathroom is a really good place to do taming. Uh, it can be isolated long term for a long project, but there are solutions to that that we will get into. Uh, the first thing you want to do is tuck that uh, shower curtain up out of the way. They'll be climbing that and shredding the plastic. You can tuck a towel into the lid of the toilet seat. Uh, you want to get rid of that paper to uh, toilet paper roll. They'll be using that as a hamster wheel. You can put in a litter box like you normally would. If you put in a carrier, make sure it has uh, slots on the side so they can see and they can't just completely hide away. Uh, you want to get rid of all the toothbrushes, soap dishes, perfume bottles, anything that they could knock off and break or get into that they shouldn't. And uh, you can put in a radio for the long hours that you're not there. Maybe uh, turn it to talk radio and tuck the cord out of the way so they don't pull it down on top of themselves. Oh, one just a real quick sidebar. Kittens that come in off the street, a lot of times you give them a really, really nice bed and then you're cleaning one day and you go, oh my God, this bed is soaked in pee. Um, you want to just, for beginning, I just give them a cardboard box with an old towel and then when I find they're using the litter box, then I put in the nice, comfy, fluffy bed. But in the beginning, they've had the whole out of doors as their litter box up until now. They don't know what a litter box is. They don't need to be taught, but they just got to get the idea. So I find that that old fashioned clay litter, which we hate, works best. And if they're still not sure what to do, just throw in a handful of dirt. But hold off on the, the ones we like, the flushable ones, the, you know, all that stuff. It just confuses them in the beginning. You just can't give feral kittens a proper flea bath when you bring them in off the street. And you can't even safely hold them to put the uh, drops on the back of their neck. But you can easily give them dewormer in some baby food, some strongid or pyrantal. But until you can give them a proper flea treatment, Capstar will kill fleas on a kitten within four hours. One pill crushed in some baby food, they'll gobble it right up. And a half tablet is safe for four-week-old kittens. Now, you don't have to be even indoors. We did a, in a huge TNR project of like 80 cats and we walked away with 26 kittens. We had kittens in every space we could imagine. And we, the older ones, we had these three and four month old kittens. We weren't really sure if they were even going to be tameable, but we thought, let's give it a try. So we got a great big Great Dane uh, dog pen that you see I actually got inside. There were a couple of us inside there at times. If you're going to be doing a lot of taming, you can build a pen and they have these prefab ones, catios that you can buy online. This one I got the oh, 20 years ago, I bought one from CD Pet Products and then I just started building them myself based on their really excellent design. But if you do want to buy one, they come actually pre-drilled. The screws are pre-drilled. You can put it together in a couple of hours. You could tame a litter of kittens in the backyard if you had to outdoors. If mom isn't too feral and she'll allow the kittens to come close to you, uh, you could uh, work with them, roll kib kibble to them, draw them closer and closer. Eventually they'd be coming up and eating in your lap. Uh, the reason to bring them inside is for our convenience. One day it's raining, mom gets suspicious, she moves the litter. But if all goes well, you can make a lot of progress right outdoors. If you have an outdoor feral cat that you'd like to offer to come in on the cold winter nights, uh, I'd recommend you start in the backyard. That's a good place to start. In the early spring, start putting the food down, bring the bowl closer and closer. Through the summer, be spending more and more time with the cat. At some point, leave your hand on the dish. You'll be petting the cat, maybe be able to lift it up or even just invite it in to the back porch to stay overnight. And by winter, you may have a cat that feels comfortable being around you and spending more time inside. You may eventually need to trap the cat and confine it for the cooling off period. But this initial socialization in the backyard can shorten that period significantly and make the cat comfortable indoors much more quickly. We're gonna talk about those disarming techniques, but there's a fourth one that I don't wanna go any farther without addressing. And can you guess what it is? It's the human factor. It's our behavior. 
There's a real Zen to uh, guiding cats to socialization. You want to take a deep breath before you go in the room. You want to like not put too much pressure on yourself. Chill out and come in and try and be really Zen about it. In the very beginning, you do not want to engage them. You don't want to say, hi, sweetie, come on, we're going to do some socialization work. They really just want benign neglect kind of at that point, because if you engage them, that's what engages that fight or flight instinct. You want to do all these things engaging them, but not in the beginning. You want to kind of pretend to be disinterested. You want to act sleepy as if you're too tired to even care. Oh, I couldn't hunt you. I would could care less because you're probably going to be tired if you're trying to fit socializing in before and after work. Just go in in the beginning, spend as much time as you can between meals, reading, just do social media on your phone, whatever. Nothing too noisy or no hysterical laughing phone calls, but as long as it's just you in the room, it's really great. Oh, I want to tell a story about my friend, Betsy. She's very allergic to cats and she would never come over to the apartment if she could help it. But I don't remember why for some, we were meeting to get together and she had to come to the apartment. She got there and I thought, oh, just a second, Betsy, I have to send this email. I'm on a deadline. I'll be, I'll be out in a second. So she sat down on the couch. She's just terrified thinking about her allergies. I came out after I finished and she was sitting ramrod straight, facing straight forward. And there were like six feral cats like surrounded her. One was batting her hair. One was sniffing her purse. One was like, had her pants leg. One was just standing there staring at her. And I realized the best thing you can do for an under-socialized cat is just completely ignore them because then their curiosity, they're confident enough to be curious about you. If you're engaging them, they're terrified. But if you kind of just ignore them, their fight or flight or freeze impulse just goes away and they can become curious. So you don't want to stare at them. You can glance at them, say, hey, yeah, I saw you. I'm not interested because they're thinking, oh, he didn't see us yet. Once he sees us, we're goners, you know, glance at them and then just go, yeah, whatever. When you're working with them, don't sit squared off cross-legged straight at them. You want to kind of turn sideways. It's uncomfortable. You get a kink in your side, but that's what it takes. When you're moving, going about doing stuff, don't walk like Marcel Marceau. Just move at a casual pace. And just mumble to yourself under your breath. You want them to get used to a human voice, talking, 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 but don't stare right at them and say, hi, sweetie, how are you today? In the beginning, forget about all that fun stuff and we'll get to it. You know, you can build to it later. So food is the go-to incentive to get them to come to you, especially the young kittens. They're hungry all the time for the reasons we talked about. They're ravenous and you can just about always work with kittens with food. It's just effortless a lot of times, especially with the young ones. And a really good thing to get to once you've gotten them eating right next to you, the hand feeding that I referred to earlier and you saw them run away. If you can start some hand feeding, initiate hand feeding, then that they're going to associate that hand coming at them, which terrifies them with something good, the food that they want. The, my favorite is Gerber um, chicken baby food. Uh, I like the texture of Gerber. It has a little cornstarch in it, which uh, is to prevent human babies from having diarrhea. You see the calories there, but there are a lot of other bribes people use. Um, flakes of mackerel. I always get in water, not oil, uh, sardines, stuff in water. You can break up lunch meat, those churu type uh, lickable treats, they're great, but I put it on my finger because the whole point of this hand feeding is getting your hand in their face. People say, oh, well, I, I like the baby food, but I put it on a long spoon. And I'm thinking, well, that's fine to give them a free taste of it, but your hand in their face is the whole point of it. So you don't want to stick with that long, you know, arm's length spoon thing. Um, and then I put in red there, uh, gently roll dry kibble to draw them closer and closer when they're staying far away from you. You can like, like shooting marbles, you can shoot it less and less far. So they're coming closer and you'll actually get to a point. You'll see there's a cat later on where I was actually hand feeding, handing one piece of kibble at a time. And the cat was, uh, is taking it out of my hand. So these bribes are going to come in and helpful. Okay, let's go back. We're getting into the techniques here. I'm trying to introduce hand feeding to these kittens. You see they ate some of the food in the dish. So I came back a half an hour later. And of course, since they're kittens, they're already hungry. But you see, they're not happy. I just put the dish in there before. Now I'm putting my hand in their face. But this is only 
two and a half hours after they've been off the street. They're very interested. That's the brave guy who was in the front before, and now the others are trying to get behind him. But even he's a little intimidated by my hand, but they're all really intrigued by that smell. Oh, I have to publicly apologize now for a comment I made in a video 18 years ago. I said, Gerber chicken baby food is the crack cocaine for kittens. Now, jokes about uh, drugs are not funny, and I, I concede that, so this is my public apology. But you can see how intrigued they were by the um, smell of that baby food. It's nutritionally exactly what, it's pure meat with water. That's what they need. So as afraid they are of my hand, they're intrigued by the smell. Now look at the brave guy. He's pushing everybody out of the way. He's getting forward. If, uh, he's getting right into it. And he's getting his free sample. So he's, he's learning now that you lick this. It's not something you chomp. And uh, he's ready to now lick it off my finger. He goes straight from his taste and he knows to lick it. Uh, you want to give him a free sample in the beginning because if you, if the first, uh, if the first experience they have with it is off your finger, uh, they sometimes will chomp and those little teeth are very, very sharp. So I smeared some on his paw to get him to taste it, and I backed away. So he had courage to taste it without my hand right in his face, and that was his free sample. Then I come back immediately. At this age, it all goes so quickly. This is the exact same thing that's going to happen with our three and four and sometimes even adult cats. It just takes so much longer the older they are. Here at six weeks, in real time, you're watching them sort of tame themselves. And the girl, who has the slightly more ingrained fight or flight, even at six weeks, I smear some on her nose, she licks it off. And then, as even as shy and frightened she was relatively to the boys, she's right in the game. It's really amazing to imagine how quickly they're adapting to a total change in the world as they knew it. She's licking it right off my finger, and in very short order, the female kitten who has the slight, we're gonna go into why, but she has a slightly more ingrained fight or flight instinct, much younger than the boys. She's on an even keel with the boys at six weeks um, within an hour. Now, that doesn't happen the same with the three- and four-month-old and the older cats. I found the best crutch now to get them to come to me, and you see she's going for that last little drop there on the plate. She, that, that's how much they love this stuff. Now, this is a three-month-old kitten, and I want to give her her little taste and smell, and I've kind of got her in the corner. This guy, I'm not really scruffing him. I was just trying to get him to smell it, push. But you see, even that little tiny bit of confinement was a bad idea. I shouldn't have, you know, tried to confine him. So she's smelling it. She's licking her lips. She's interested, but she's in that corner. So she's not really happy. So I know she wants it. So I move away and I go to the other side of the pen to let them have. And then with freedom, she comes right over. It was her choice. I didn't have her backed into the corner. I let her smell it, but then I back away and let her come to it. Now I'd like to show you the difference of trying to introduce the hand feeding to four month old kittens. One month older, it is much more difficult, especially with the female kitten. You saw the male kitten, he was up there closer to me. He was very skittish, but he was agreeing to come up and eat near me. The four month old female kitten here she um, she's doing the hand feeding at arm's length, but she does not want to come close to me. I really have to reach way back to her, and she's kind of holding me hostage at arm's length. So today I'm going to try and be really tough, and I'm going to make her come forward to get that baby food that she really likes. Um, you see she takes one step up. And when I go to reload my finger, she steps back. This time she only went back one foot. Now she's getting a little closer. Um, every fiber of her being is telling her, don't go anywhere near this guy. It's not a good idea. But you can almost see the wheels turning in her mind um, that this is what her body is telling her that she needs. And she is really tortured making these steps forward. 
Here's where you have to make sure you hold tough and make them keep moving forward. Otherwise, as I said, they'll hold you hostage and you'll just be at this stage for six months. You really have to force them to keep going. So look, she's up all four feet up on this little platform. She's right near me. And um, I'm just going to keep the food coming. And as long as she's willing to stay, she can have as much as she wants. And she's made the choice to come up. But this is how much harder it was with the four-month-olds than with the three-month-olds or even the six-a-week-olds. So the next day, she made that choice the day before, and she just comes right up as if she's been doing it all along. It didn't really take much of a choice, and so that hard work uh, was permanent. She so after watching that female four-month-old uh, struggle with coming close to me, now would be a really good time to discuss the difference of male to female and why female kittens generally take longer to socialize. So from four to six weeks, you really can't tell much difference male to female. And then from there, it develops exponentially at a very different rate. As you saw with that young female kitten, she had a little bit more hesitance uh, to eat, but it really took her only about a half an hour. Whereas with a male kitten, it's so gradual, the onset, that you can sometimes with a 16-week-old male kitten, you can tame him more easily than you can an eight-week-old female kitten. That's not a hard, fast rule, but like in humans, in cats, there are different rates of mental development, male to female. The frontal cortex develops much more slowly in males than it does in females. And that is where the comprehension of the consequences of your actions is processed. So that's why the female kitten was so reticent to take any risks and why female kittens can be harder to tame and the male kittens can sometimes be tamed at a much advanced age because their comprehension of their consequences develops more slowly. You would not have to explain to the female kitten why it's a bad idea to put your home phone number and address on your Facebook page. But you might have to explain to a 16-week-old male kitten why that is such an unwise move. By now, you've probably guessed why the female kittens are uh, advancing at such a fast pace. Uh, they can become pregnant at four months old, and they could be delivering kittens on their six-month birthday. That is why nature is getting them ready so quickly, faster than their brothers. Nature doesn't really ask much of the male kittens. All they have to do is learn how to hunt to feed themselves and stay out of the way of the dominant males of the colony. On the other hand, the female kittens have a laundry list of things that they need to have under their belt before they're six months old. Pretty soon, she's going to be raising a litter with no help from anyone. So she's got to have single parenting ability to keep that litter alive until maturity. That means she's got to learn to hunt, and then she's got to hunt enough to have enough milk for the litter. And then she's got to choose a safe place to give birth to those kittens. And then she's got to move that den at appropriate stages. When they start crawling around, then she needs to make sure that they're not going to crawl out of the litter. But then when they're big enough that to go out and hunt with her, they've got to be able to jump and get in and out of the place. So she's got a lot of times has to move her den three times. Then she's got to teach them how to hunt. These are minute to minute, 24 seven decisions she's got to make assessing the danger and risk for the survival of the litter. This is why we're so strict with the technique about uh, no free rides past eight weeks old. Some people interpret that as cruel, that why would you withhold food from cats so that they would be hungry enough to work with you? Well, with young kittens, you really don't have to withhold food at all. They're hungry all the time and you can work them very easily. As they get older though, past eight weeks, you can safely space the meals apart so that they're hungry enough to work because if we wanna get them adopted, which is our, our goal, we're really going to have to hold the line otherwise Otherwise, we're going to have unadoptable older feral kittens. So when you leave the room, all food leaves the room with you, wet and dry food. You, of course, always leave fresh water, but 12 hours between meals is okay for a three-month-old kitten, especially if they're not improving. Once you break through, you won't have to do that. You can work with them much more easily 
but they will make more effort if they are hungrier at each session. Four to five month old kittens, they may require a few days of just feeding once a day to make a breakthrough. Their constitution can withstand that and then feed them as much as they want if they're cooperating. Sometimes the uh, cats will cooperate for the very first part of the session when they're really hungry, and then after they've had a few bites, then they become less and less cooperative. Uh, and in those cases, people sometimes wanna do several small meals that don't fill them up. And that's really good because you come back several times in the day, they get more interaction, and uh, you don't have to do the same thing every day. One day you have time and you do a lot of small sessions with them. Other day, uh, one meal, two meals, uh, but just hang tough until you make a breakthrough. Once you make that breakthrough, they understand the routine and they're working with you. You can feed them, go in as many times as you want and work with them and they will cooperate because they'll understand what's going on. The next step is usually drawing them into your lap. You can just sit on the floor with a plate of food and get them to come to you. Uh, this time he's up on that crate, so I'm sitting up on a crate also. He's climbing right across onto my knee. This is a good stage in, before, in between hand feeding and before you start to initiate contact. She wants that baby food, so she hops right up into my lap, which is great. Um, but you'll notice something quirky. Uh, being female, she happens to just look up in my eyes and she's just not ready to make eye contact. As calm as she is with me, that eye contact tells her to run away. She'll be right back, but uh, it's a step in the progress. After they're not afraid of the hands coming at you, the hand feeding, now we want to get into initiating contact, petting, touching. I'd like to try it with a dish of food. Just put down a dish of food and then start petting them. But you see my hand just starts to come toward her and whoop, she backs away. So I go back to, I'm going to mix up the hand feeding with the petting a little bit. You can try different things, but with these guys, I try to get my hand around the back so she doesn't see it coming. And it doesn't work really well right in the beginning. You just have to keep trying. And if they're hungry enough, if they're hungry enough, this is the first meal of the day. I tried it a little bit with the hand. They're really hungry. And after a couple of days, I can go right in with my hand and start petting. Because of the camera angle, it was kind of weird. I'd rather be kind of on the side of them so they don't see my hand coming. Now, the four-month-old kittens, they're in the back. They don't want to have anything to do with this. In fact, one of the three-month-olds is back with them. They're horrified by the fact that they're watching me pet the other ones. But it's in a way, they're getting used to the idea. Before it happens to them, they're saying, oh, okay, this is happening. Um, we put these two litters together by necessity. Uh, I'm not recommending that you mix different levels of cats, but that's just how this happened. But those um, four-month-old kittens and one of the three-month, uh, they're not see staring. They can't even look at me, this idea of getting petted. Here in this video, you can see the uh, better angle to initiate contact. You see I'm drawing her forward and I'm going to put my uh, right hand down and make it stable so it stops moving. She's very aware of it. She's watching uh, and she's, but I'm going to try and draw her forward so that rather than reach straight at her face, I'm coming from the side uh, and she's more calm about letting me touch her and uh, initiate contact. This is a 10 week old female kitten. Um, I was asked to come in and see if I could make some suggestions. She was thought to be a really bad influence on the rest of the litter. She was swatting and hissing and she was separated from her siblings and was isolated. Uh, we don't ever do this at Urban Cat League. We find that the cats that are coming along well are a good influence on the feistier ones. And the feisty ones see that, oh, they're getting um, treats, they're getting baby food, they're getting benefits by cooperating and coming forward. Whereas if they're isolated, they're all by themselves, they have no comparison, no frame of reference. And we find that they don't actually uh, make progress. It might be easier for the other kittens to work with them, but these guys um, don't do um, as well. And uh, spoiler alert, we're going to talk later on about how to use um, the presence of a friendly adult cat to benefit your taming and also the drawbacks of trying to teach um, to teach from tame to tame from a crate. Uh, my recommendation was to get her out of a cage and give her some more freedom of movement to make choices. And uh, she did ultimately make a lot of progress and she got adopted. Barry 
uh, is a very good example of a kitten that you should not wrap in a towel and force to be handled. Uh, when I speak to people who use that technique and they think it works well, they tell me it works with their young kittens or if they're all at all older that they're male kittens. Um, a kitten like Barry, although she's only 10 weeks old, she's already acting like a very streetwise protective mother cat. Uh, when cats have kittens, they take very few chances. They don't take any risks of getting grabbed or trapped because they know they have to get back to their litter and if anything happens, they won't be able to protect them. Male kittens don't have that deeply ingrained fight or flight instinct. A lot of times they don't even know why they're swatting and hissing. They're just really nervous about it. But the female kittens seem really invested in it and they know exactly why uh, they're afraid of you. And if you wrap them in a towel, you might never ever have a lap cat and they might never actually be comfortable being handled or petted. So if you let them take their time, let them make the choices, get them out of a cage where they feel backed in and trapped, let them make some calm choices and really get interested in that uh, incentive you're offering without the distraction of being trapped and backed into a corner, um, then you can make some real progress. Here I'm hand feeding the four month old kittens up really close. Uh, if you remember the three month old kittens, uh, they became comfortable eating near me out of a dish. And then I started the hand feeding at arm's length and then worked in and got them closer and then started the petting. The four month old kittens, they actually at arm's length, they became more comfortable with the hand feeding than ever coming up close. But I finally got up close and I'm able to start the petting. It just took much, much, much longer, which is very common. They're a month older. It's a world of difference. Uh, but we got there. We, uh, but don't expect it to all go in the exact same order. Uh, they got adopted and we got there. It just took longer. Now, this is a part of socializing that I think gets neglected a lot. If you want to pick up a cat, you're going to have to reach down and touch their belly and lift them off the ground. So people sometimes go from just petting to lifting. You need to desensitize their belly before you lift them off the ground. Predators grab them, throw them over, and disembowel them. They rip their stomach open, which is why instinctively cats are very, most cats are very protective of their stomach. So I'm working with the four month olds here. And every time I go to touch Tiffany's belly, she stops and she's going to go away. She's not afraid of me. She doesn't even know why she wants that baby food. It's easy to bring her back. And so then I stop, just go back to petting and I'll go back and work with her brother a little bit and get her, get her fight or flight in, uh, impulse um, under control and then make her forget about that. And then I will go back and pet her and work my way into where I'm going to touch her belly. Um, but this is a very important step before you're going to do any lifting. And but I go to touch her belly and she's very hesitant and a little, she stays a little bit longer this time. And but then she thinks, I think I'll just go away. She's not swatting. She's not biting. She's not hissing. It's just that um, impulse to to flee. You see, the four month olds are way in the back and still won't come near me, but I'm ready to start the next step with the three month olds. I'm going to just start lifting them very low to the ground. I call it nudging. First thing that I put a big plate of food down and they come over to eat. And then I just start turning them around, like uh, moving them six inches to the left, to the right, helicopter, turn them around, lift them very, very close to the ground and just nudging them back and forth. I've been doing this for a while and pretty successfully, they go right back to eating. They have to be hungry. I don't even have to use the baby food. They're just eating regular nutritious cat food. You see the third guy, I was able to lift him from a foot off the ground and lift him down. He wasn't hungry, but he wasn't freaked out by it. This next thing, we're going to go to the lifting, the actual lifting up off the ground. You want to have food ready. You don't want to have to burrito them. You don't want to have to scruff them to do socializing. You just have to get them engrossed with food right in their face. Just short circuit that fight or flight or freeze response before you're going to lift them off the ground. 
Now this first time here, I've been working with her for a while. So I was able to lift her up off the ground and not have the food ready. But ideally, if that was the first time, I definitely would have had a little bowl of dish, the lid or some food, baby food in my hand. And I'm thinking, gee, she's usually fine with this. What's going on today? And she was really kind of skittish and she wasn't it. So I said, okay, let her go. Not going to force you to do anything. And then I remembered, oh, she doesn't like the turkey baby food. She likes the chicken baby food. So once I got the chicken baby food, that was the key to her and she was much more cooperative. And this is so funny because every kitten is gonna have a favorite thing which is gonna help you. And especially with the difficult ones, you wanna learn what that one thing is that they like because that's gonna help you with the breakthrough for them. So let her go. Good. This guy, I go, and of course the rug, his claws get picked up in the rug. And sometimes you're trying to be so smooth and you're going to do it so gently and have it. And then you're the whole bed, they're lifting the whole bed attached to their claws. With these older three, four month old kittens, I do not try and do their nails. And normally with the young ones, I'll extrude their paws and get them used to the idea of having their paws handled and their nails trimmed. But I do not do it with these older ones. I think it's just enough to just get them friendly and used to being around people. But I do not try and do their nails. With the very young kittens, you also want to handle their paws as much as possible. You can extrude their claws, just play with their hands so they get used to the idea of maybe having their nails trimmed as when they get older. They're doing really well after a week of uh, hand feeding and lowering them to my lap. I'm able to pick them up uh, without much desensitizing of the belly. Uh, it goes so much more quickly at this age, of course. And when you can set them up in a pop-up tent like this and they have uh, room to uh, run around and, uh, and play in between and be out in the household, it really is an advantage. Um, also, you see I'm holding them up to my chest. At this age, they seem to respond really well to feeling your heartbeat uh, if you can uh, hold them up that way. And uh, it's something like, I guess, what they would experience with their mother feeding them. And uh, they seem to really enjoy uh, being cuddled up close and feeling that heartbeat at this age. Once you get them calm and they're comfortable, uh, you want to get them uh, out of the bathroom, in so out of solitary confinement, uh, the basement or whatever. Uh, and I don't cover up pens. People cover up the pen. I maybe cover up one or two sides of it, but I want them completely exposed. I want them to see what's going on, hear the phone ring, uh, vacuuming in the other room. Don't vacuum right next to their pen. The doorbell knocks on the door, you talking on the phone, the television going, um, all that you want to get them exposed to. When you have a rambunctious little guy like this one, and uh, he's preventing you from working with the shy kittens in the litter, um, you can put him in the uh, pop-up tent and then you could work with the shyer siblings in the bathroom, or you could do the opposite. But it's really great when you have the option of two different spaces to mix it up so that you can work with those shy kittens that don't get enough attention because the ones that are doing well are like climbing all over you and kind of in the way. You can also just put them in a carrier but it's much nicer for this guy to burn off some uh, energy uh, and not be in, sitting in a carrier. If you've got the kitten set up in a space you feel really in control in a small bathroom or a small room, you may be hesitant to take them out into the house for fear they're gonna get away from you when you haven't socialized them enough where you can really handle them easily. But here's some things you can try. Getting them into the carrier in the bathroom is easy, and then you can offload them into the cattery in the house. But now getting them back to take them back uh, to sit on the floor with them and work with them. I like these top loading carriers. You can put in some food. They'll go in. You could saw me reach inside and pull the door closed. Then when I get out into the space, if it's the reverse, I can just toss a toy, put some food down. The first time you might want to get in there with them, uh, zip up the pen so that uh, nobody gets loose, make sure everything's okay and stay inside with them. Uh, but these guys have been doing it. They know the drill and they'll uh, go out and enjoy running around and then I can zip that up and nobody gets loose. So this is just the reverse of, uh, of going, bringing, going back in with the uh, carrier to get them. Uh, but you might be able to just set them up in the uh, pop-up tent. They could live in the pop-up tent if you can leave one set up. Uh, in your living room. Uh, but if you, you don't, you can just take it up and 
put it down. Uh, but the moving them back and forth from one area to another, oh, it just started raining. Um, that's what that noise is in the background. Moving them back and forth uh, can be really good, especially if they're going to go to an adoption setting where there's a little bit of chaos and things uh, change a lot. If they're moving from uh, one place to another, getting picked up and moved, that can be a good routine for them. And uh, you can be just taking them back and maybe they spend most of their time in a cattery like this and they only do the sessions in the uh, pop-up tent where you get down on the floor with them or you can use a bathroom. Any combination can work, but one component has to be a semi-large space where you get down on the floor, they can stay away from you and they have the choice to come up to you. Uh, any combination of that can work. If you're using a bathroom to do the socialization where you're down on the floor with them, but you want to get them out into the house in the noisy part of the house, get them used to a busy household, you can just roll a cattery right up to the doorway. Most bathroom doors open inward, and then you can be inside the bathroom, load them into the cattery with a laser light or food. One thing, though, the wheels, there's a small space underneath. It's only a couple of inches, but very, very young kittens uh, six, seven week old kittens, they can crawl in underneath. So you want to stuff a towel under the very bottom when you're doing the loading and the unloading. Um, but the larger kittens usually can't get under there. And then close the door on them and then roll them back out into a busy part of the house for the time that you're not working with them. And then you can do the, do the reverse. It works really well. Of course, neither one of these are feral kittens. And neither one is going to fit underneath but near the wheels but that was just for demonstration. But the same technique works well with under-socialized indoor cats. A lot of people have rescued a feral cat from outdoors. They're living perfectly fine indoors, but occasionally you have to sequester them. This guy was in the pen for a week to get uh, medication twice a day. And now we have still have to keep an eye on him. So we're gonna offload him into the bathroom, but we wanna give him more space and gradually get him back into the routine. We do have a, a video on our YouTube channel of, for hacks for people living with indoor ferals. You may find that presentation helpful if you're living with an indoor feral and you have concerns about getting them into a carrier when you need to and uh, getting them to the vet for their uh, routine health care. When you have them out in a busy space with the cattery, there's a couple of beneficial things you can practice while you're out there. You can bring them out that way, if they uh, get uh, frisky and scamper away, you can put them right back in. This practice is also really good when you're going to start moving them from one space to another, either out into the pop-up tent for exercise or out of the bathroom or into the cattery so they're in the activity of the house back and forth. And also sometimes the first time you bring them out, if you have the grill exposed like that, they'll sort of grab onto the grill and they won't run off. This is a good preparation. You'll kind of know when you go to pick them up, you'll know what to expect. It's a good test of uh, how they're going to be when you pick them up and you stand at full height. This is the really shy little girl. She's now eight weeks old. She's ready for her spay appointment and then to go up for adoption. She's doing very, very well. But this is a good practice just to see how they do up at shoulder height, having holding them up high up in the air. The next thing would be then to you know hold her for longer and longer period of time, um, not not standing on the top of the pen, but actually holding her. And when you're going to want to put them in the arms of a prospective adopter, you want to make sure that they're comfortable up at that high level up off the ground. And this is just sort of a, a beginning practice to having holding them up high up in the air. The laser light is a great tool. It's wonderful for interactive play. Uh, they quickly learn that you're they're playing with you. They look back at you when it goes off, uh, but it has many other uses. It allows you to corral them without having to pick them up. So every time you pick them up, you're not you know punishing them by putting them in confinement. You can load them into the cattery and roll it back to the bathroom and then use it to get them out of the cattery and back into the bathroom. You can load them into a carrier. Uh, it's really handy to use and uh, avoids having to pick them up. Uh, you can use food to get them in where you want them to go. You could get a friendly adult cat that they're really fond of. You could put the adult cat in there and they would go into the uh, uh, the pop-up tent or wherever. Uh, but it's a great tool and you don't have to be picking them up so they don't have a bad association. 
I put a carrier out of the way under the kitchen table with a nice bed inside and uh, the cats tend to uh, just go in there and uh, hang out and if I ever have to uh, surprise one and take it to the vet I can quickly close the door. I toss treats back in the back so they're facing the other direction and uh, they tend to uh, <laughs> compete for it. They like this spot and uh, the uh, really shy ones to take turns taking naps in there. I throw treats in every day, tuna fish in a bowl, whatever it takes to get them comfortable going in and out. They don't think anything of it. You can actually take the door completely off and then put the door back on only when you need to. It's a good system just to have them used to going in and out of the carrier. They don't think anything of it. Then if once in a while you surprise somebody, close it in there, they forget about it in a week once you get back and everything's over with because it's part of their daily routine and then once a year or once every, you know, once in a while somebody getting surprised and carried away isn't the lasting memory. The lasting memory is that it's a really fun place to be and it's a secret hiding place. Now let's look at the third variable um, for successful socialization, nature nurture. And let's look at how we might be able to troubleshoot how um, the cat's genetics combine with the life experience before they get to you and how we might be able to uh, facilitate a, a better socialization. We have all heard that calicos can be a little standoffish, a little high strung. They can be difficult, but not always the case. These two girls live in my house. Um, they uh, don't often get in the bed together, but they do, and they're perfectly tame and friendly. So there are exceptions to genetics. As I said, all everything in this presentation, they're just pointers to help you kind of gauge where you are and help you get a plan together. But look at that little kitten up in the corner. He hasn't even got his ears up, and he looks like a real, she looks like a grump. So they can be a challenge. This picture is very informative. Uh, that is a tricolor cat. It's a dark picture, but she does have orange and black. And she is riveted on the caretaker at a distance. That caretaker is not far enough away for her taste for her to start eating. And the kitten to the right, the, to the left, to her right, the kitten, the white kitten, I would bet my bottom dollar that she's female. And she is also staring at that caretaker and she's saying, I don't know why we're not eating yet, but mom's not eating. And whatever that is over there, it's probably a really bad thing because mom's really not letting us go eat. And then the one in the back, I'll bet, is a boy and he's going, oh, uh, how come we're not eating yet? That looks really good. I think it's chicken. Is that chicken? How come we're not eating? So if... If I were going to hope to tame these kittens for adoption, I would want to get them away from that mother as soon as possible. They're old enough because every day she's teaching them uh, to fear humans more and more. This is not only her genetics, perhaps because she's tricolor, she is more afraid of humans or more high strung, but she's teaching by nurture, she's teaching her kittens to have her same point of view. On the other end of the spectrum, here you have a tricolor cat. Both of these cats are neutered, but if they weren't and they were giving birth and they had a good relationship with their care caretaker, they probably would bring the kittens right to the feeding station. Uh, they probably wouldn't have an undue fear of humans and they could probably be tamed pretty quickly. The nature-nurture aspects um, of the equation are usually largely unknown. Uh, we don't know the genetics of a cat. Usually we use the example of the tricolor cat because that's something we can see. Uh, but the rest of their genetics we really don't know. And uh, we don't always know um, the life experience of the cat. If you are the caretaker of the colony, you may know the predisposition uh, of the general colony, that they're more relaxed or more friendly, or whether they're more high strung or not. Uh, but the takeaway, I guess, is that you've got a mixture of what the mother's been teaching the kittens and then what she's passed on to them through her own genetics. And for the most part, those are unknowns. Um, but the two extremes would be, I guess, a um, young male kitten who had a mother who was not high strung. She was rather friendly and she taught him to be trusting of humans also. That would be the easy part. The more difficult um, variable would be uh, an older kitten, perhaps tricolor, whose mother passed on genetics that made her less likely to be trusting of humans.
and also actively taught the kitten not to trust humans. So there's a very, very wide range um, of possibilities. And we're just discussing this so that you can uh, adjust to that, take it in stride, and hopefully these will be a little pointer to inform you how you might approach it. Now, here's the bad news. You can only do partial taming from a crate or cattery. Uh, you cannot fully tame a cat until they can choose, they have some choice in the matter. Every time you open that cage door, their fight or flight response just comes becomes engaged. They feel trapped, they feel backed in, and even if you do make some progress, it's not necessarily permanent. Uh, but there is one thing, if you're working in a shelter setting and you have these cages with the big doors, you can retrofit them. So there's a divider between the two cages and you could do a version of this, they're on one side and you're on the other. And if they choose to come through the little hole and they wanna to come to you, that gives them some choice. So I think this would be a much, much more conducive setup to do some socializing. Here's a sort of a cautionary tale. Uh, it has a happy ending, spoiler alert, has a very happy ending, but boy, this first um, video here is, is really frustrating. Animal Haven in New York City, which is a very, very good shelter, called me up one day and said, hey, we rescued a, a young kitten, three-month-old kitten from our animal controls that they call them animal care centers. And they thought, oh, she's young, she should be able to be adopted. Well, she was the most feral kitten that they had ever brought into the shelter and they were just getting nowhere with her and said, could you please uh, see what you can do? And I said, well, I'm happy to help, but I don't really have a, I don't have a bathroom. I've got a full, full house here, but I'll take her, I'll put her in a cattery and I'll see if I can just get her, you know, cooled off, comfortable being in a busy household and see how, see how we can do. So this is before I knew about the pop-up tents. Otherwise I would have just set one up in my living room. She was not having any of it. She was lunging, hissing, swatting at me. I could barely even put the bowl there in first. But after a couple of weeks, I thought, well, let me see what we can do here with hand feeding because she does not, definitely does not want to get touched or petted. And so she swatted the baby food off my, um, my finger and she got a taste of it. And she thought, oh, okay, I really don't want to put my tongue on that awful human finger, but that stuff tastes pretty good. So she thought she'd, she'd give it a try. And I went to reload my finger and she looks up and she goes, oh wow, a whole dish of that stuff, okay. So I went the next, came back the next day and she went right in, right for it. And I thought, okay, okay, even, the, even in a cage, she doesn't have a lot of choice in the matter. I thought, okay, happy cat, maybe we're getting somewhere. I went out of the room and then I came back in and she looked and I thought, uh-oh, she only did it because she was hungry. Unfortunately, this is a perfect example of what you do not want to happen with your socialization project. Here you have a cat with a full on fight or flight or freeze response uh, who's chosen survival. She's coming up to eat, hating every minute of being touched and this is diminishing returns. We're getting farther and farther away from socialization. Although she's allowing handling and being touched with each meal, she's hating being around people more and more and more. So this is exactly what we don't want. So I completely stopped this socialization. She got to a point where she'd rather just sit in the corner and not eat than be touched by people. And so um, I decided that until I had enough space to socialize her properly, where she had an option to retreat and come to me by choice, I would completely stop because this was making things worse. So um, this is a perfect segue to the next option in our toolkit of incentives that we can use. Now we get into interactive play, which a lot of times, especially with the older kittens, uh, can help you a lot where they're not as riveted by food and you can get them to come to you. A lot of times it can be sometimes with some cats, even a more powerful tool than the food if they have a really strong play drive. I recently learned of a study that came out of Australia where an animal behaviorist studied the most um, active time in a cat's life where the play drive is the strongest. And I believe it was between nine and 16 weeks, which makes uh, perfect sense with uh, my experience. A lot of times with older kittens, uh, they're not as hungry uh, as the young kittens. And so you can make a lot more progress with uh, interactive play sometimes than you can with food with a particularly feisty uh, kitten. 
Uh, with the young kittens, it works really well also with a wand toy or a fishing pole or just tie a string onto any toy and just start uh, dragging it across your knees and your your legs and they'll completely get lost in the game and forget they're coming in contact with you. It's a good way to get them to make initial contact. Now here's the happy ending. Here's what happened with um, Andy. Her name was Andy. There she, she takes the kibble right out of my hand. I was doing really well with hand feeding and uh, she, um, she, she just soft paw knocked it. She said, you're not holding it right. Um, but you see, even with petting, she still was not happy with it. It was not going well. But one day I was playing with a cat outside the pen and I saw she is so riveted on this toy. Her fight or flight instinct was completely relaxed. She was so completely uh, engrossed in the toy. And I thought, well, let's see how I can get it. It didn't work right away, but I thought this is a level of relaxation I haven't seen with her before. And she, um, I just thought, let me see how far I can get with this. And she got so interested in the toy that she let me pet her. And you see here, I'm petting her and uh, she's doing better and better. And she's just really, really riveted on the toy and her fight or flight instinct is completely shut down. So I'm thinking, oh, this is fantastic. Even though she's in the pen, I'm making, here at least I'm making some, some progress. And she would at some point, sometimes she'd just lay down and say, okay, I'll be petted. She stopped playing for a little bit and then she gets back into her play. But the key to it <clears throat> was the interactive play. And the good part about it is that they, they instantly know that you're making it go. They're playing with you. Came back the next day, I thought, oh, she's playing with the toy. Do I dare reach behind her? I don't want to scare her or surprise her. She barely looked over her shoulder. She pushed herself into my hand. And I thought, okay, let's forget about the food. She has such stress over the food. I'm just gonna give her a free ride with the food and we're just gonna work until I can get her out into a space. I'm just gonna work with the toy. This was fantastic and I decided, you know what? I still don't have a small space. I'm just gonna turn her loose in the house because I know how much she likes to play and I know she's not afraid of being petted. She's actually purring and she enjoys it. The only thing left to do is for her to make a choice to come to me out of trust. So I just let her go. And she, of course, didn't want to come anywhere near me, didn't want me to touch her at all. But I knew fully well that that was what was going to happen when she had free choice. So she would do these drive-bys with the toy. She'd come running and flying and playing. And I'm trying to choke up on the toy. So instead of having the cat dancer at three feet, I've got it at a foot and a half and then six inches. And then uh, there's this other stick that she liked to play with this, this stick, which was a, a, a string toy. And I'm just trying to get closer and closer to her because I know she's let, she's let me pet her before. She's purred. She really enjoys it. But now she has free choice. The difference is it's her choice now. And she's saying, I don't have to do anything I don't want to. Then I remembered something about being in bed when you're covered up to your covers. You're much smaller. So I thought, let me lure her up to shoulder level. If I can get her up in a height, maybe she'll be much more cooperative. So I have her distracted with the toy and I'm thinking, okay, she's going to let me touch her. She saw my hand coming. She just flopped over and let me pet her. It was her choice. She was in control. This is the lesson about when they're confined in a category. You see someone else has already taken her spot in the category, but she decided it was okay. Now she's a former feral. So you'll see that even though she loves it and she's, she, there's always that little, little instinct to flee. Don't let your guard down too much. Reminds me of those old cartoons where the angel's on one shoulder and the devil's on the other and the angel's saying, they're so sweet. They're so nice to you. They would never do a thing. And the devil's going, don't let them forget you're a cat. You could bite them. You could scratch your tail going. Her ears are up a little bit. And um, I'm, I, I know I should just walk away at that point, but I wanted, yeah, I wanted to show the camera that she went to check me, just to swap me. She wasn't mad. Just that devil was saying, don't let your guard down. Don't let your guard. So you make, you do the possession, you pet as long as they're enjoying it, purring it, purring, and everything's okay. Um, and whenever they turn around and then they want to just check you and you just walk away. Okay, we'll come back later. Now this is not, with these former feral kittens, it's not like the pet-induced aggression where they grab onto you with both claws and they start biting. It's just a check. It's just part, a little residual thing from their former um, incarnation as a feral cat. Here you see, 
No toy, no bribe, no nothing. She let me walk right up and pet her. Now this only took about a week. I turned her loose in the house um, and she was willing to choose. She wanted to get petted. She just needed her free choice. So I called them up at Animal Haven. I said, I think she's ready for adoption. And the day before I took her in, I thought, well, let me see if I can, if I can uh, nudge her, just lift her a little bit. And she actually let me lift her and turn around. And I thought, oh, great. So at this point, I like to get them adopted because I think that they, they're, they're going to get used to uh, that with the adopter. You don't need to take them to full level of picking them up. This next clip has so much uh, loud noise and dogs barking, I wanted to just clarify beforehand. I think it's much better that these under-socialized cats get adopted directly from the uh, foster home or where they're being socialized, where they'll show best and be more confident. They often backslide a lot in an adoption setting because there just aren't enough volunteers, enough time to continue to work with them, with the hand feeding and keep them socialized. Um, but uh, Andy did well, and you'll see her in the next clip. Hi, Mike. Look who's here. Look who's here. We had an incredible breakthrough. Andy's been up on her hammock just like about a day or two now. This is the first time I've seen her since. It's Susie. And she just allowed me to pet her. And now she's enjoying some treats. She's absolutely delicious. There she is. I went right to her, the neck area where you told me she liked it. You did such a beautiful job. Look at this. Mary? Yes. Look at that. Oh, God. Did you so um, now let's get into the third variable. This is the attraction to another cat. Kittens especially are really, really attracted to, for, for protection, for a lot of uh, understandable reasons, for nurture, for education, they're really attracted to an adult cat. And they'll sometimes, if you put a friendly adult cat in your lap, they will come to you to be near that cat. And then you're in contact with them where they wouldn't normally come close to you. Another good thing about that is kittens that you brought in, taken from their mother at six weeks, an adult cat can also cue them to bathe. And there's a, an emotional component that's that's really good. Now we have found at Urban Cat League that female cats are indifferent or downright hostile to uh, kittens that aren't their own. But neutered male cats are often, well, we call them uh, the nannies, we call them mannies because the, the tomcats seem to be the best at it. This is uh, Ralphie who happens to be blind and he would grab them and he would clean them from head to toe and that's really good for their emotional development. Here's that uh, nine, 10 week old kitten that we looked at earlier and I was just evaluating her. I was trying to see how she would respond to another cat if that might uh, bring her out and be a good influence on her. She was extremely shy in the beginning um, before you saw that clip where she was, you know, letting me pet her. But uh, um, attraction to this uh, other cat, friendly cat, you see he's air-tipped, and uh, she was quite happy to come out and be near him after being in isolation. So we've got them in our laps, being petted, picked up. The next thing is, how do we do that with no bribe at all? Just handling with just the pleasure of being handled. You've made that headway with interactive play, with hand feeding, maybe an accomplice cat. Now what about just picking them up? With kittens, I like to do it after a big, big meal where their digestion is taking all their energy and they really don't have any energy to resist. And you can pick them up and put them in your lap sometimes. Now with the three month old kittens here, they're not really happy about it, and I'm not scruffing, I'm just sort of juggling. And if he wants to get away, let him get away. But they, they like the scruffing, they like the petting, but they're used to it with a bribe. They're not used to it just for the pleasure of it. But this is some somewhere to work from. And uh, they kind of, see, sit still and kind of thinks, huh, that's kind of okay. So then I've got the uh, three month old girl. And this is about a, after about a month with them. She's okay with it. They're not afraid of me. They still have that little tiny bit of uh, skittishness, but they're perfectly adoptable and they will grow in, in time. It's not over. Uh, if they, A lot of the progress will just happen over time. Now here's the three-month-old male kitten 
He clearly, of the three kittens that were three months old, he had the least fight or flight. The other one, he's kind of in, in between. He, was, he had not as much as the female kitten, but a little less fight or flight. This guy was really easy. He just didn't have a lot of fears. It was really easy to build his trust. And even at three months, it was just, there was no, you know, it wasn't fast track. It took, a, you know, a full month, but he got there and he was not too crazy. So these guys are ready for adoption. The next thing I'd like to share with you is some examination of some adult feral cats. We've looked at the younger cats and we've applied the techniques to them. And now let's look at how they work also with the older cats. Although it's a much more organic process, much more drawn out, less pressure. You kind of just look and wait and see what's going to happen. Uh, each adult cat is going to be so unique that we'd have to show you uh, dozens of examples to get one close to maybe the cat that's in front of you. But we do have one cat I'd like to look at in detail. His name is Clancy. He appeared out of nowhere in the middle of a very, very cold January. There was no colony anywhere near. There was no question of uh, TNRing him. We trapped him, had him neutered and vaccinated, and set him up in a cattery. And had no idea what we were going to do with him, but we thought we'd just sort of see what we could come up with. He adjusted uh, after about 48 hours. The first 48 hours, he trashed the pen repeatedly, tried to escape, was lunging, hissing. But fortunately, we had him in a double-decker pen, so we could change the litter box while he was up top and give him food when he was down below. And uh, that worked out pretty well. And after about 48 hours, we put him in a busy part of the house uh, with the pen covered maybe halfway. And he hey, started Mr. looking around, seeing what was going on. He got calm. He hello? stopped lunging. Mm -hmm. He uh, would hiss when you walk up to say yeah, hello. hello. But he used mm -hmm. the litter box right away. And he calmed down. And he was kind of curious about what was going on in the house. We didn't have a barn. Uh, we looked for a working cat situation that wasn't uh, immediately available. So he was being so well behaved. I just opened the door on the pen and I thought, okay, I have another cat. He's getting along well. I can always trap him again if I find a situation for him. He hid out a little bit, but he got along very well with the other cats. Former feral cats are usually extremely good with other cats. That's been their whole life, living outdoors, negotiating. They defer when necessary. They become friends when it's an opportunity. And he did very, very well. Here you see he's uh, not outdoors. He's in a catio. He immediately learned to use the... Um, cat flap and not immediately but he picked it up pretty quickly went in and out and he enjoyed going out into the catios but he wasn't trying to escape out into the outdoors here he's enjoying some uh, catnip and this is uh, Swirly who plays prominently into the story he got along very well with the other, other cats you can see immediately he's kind of very interested in Swirly and you can see he's very playful he can entertain himself as well as getting along with the other cats but as soon as he notices that someone is watching him, uh, he completely stops, wants to see what's going on. Why is a human looking at me? This is not what I want. And he would go off and hide until he thought the human had gone away. He'd get kind of grumpy, like, why are you lingering here around me? Leave me alone so I can get back to my playing. But after about six months, he became more relaxed. He wouldn't run out of the room or hide when a human came in. He just would keep a safe distance. Here at six months with total freedom, we let him ride his own ticket. He got more and more interested in mealtime. He would be right there anytime any pipe popped the lid on a, a can of food. He was right there and ready and so interested. So what's the comfort level here? Here I'm walking toward him to with a yeah. dish of food. You okay? And he's very interested, yeah. but he doesn't want oh, me boy. too close. And I thought, well, let me see if I can put it down right in front of him. So one step yeah, forward and he's okay. uh, a little antsy and going to go cute. and then yeah. I step back and he calms down okay. and then I get it's too okay. close and he's going to okay. jump okay. but then you I back up jump. and then okay, okay. and I'm You're thinking okay. don't need to escape. Oh, he is know. a little more trusting kind of than I had really anticipated. Kind of funny uh, so maybe it's we can try some of the taming techniques and I thought let's see how far we can take this. So the hand feeding wasn't really an option because right, he wasn't progress. comfortable with being that close to us. And with a multi-cat household, it wasn't possible to kind of just isolate him and, and 
inch the bowl closer and closer. So we thought, let's try the, and he likes to play a lot. Let's see what we can do with interactive play to draw him in closer. Before we continue with the story of Clancy, I do want to discuss how you can use mealtime uh, to improve the socialization of a former feral or a feral cat or an adult under socialized cat you have living in your house or that you bring into your house. Um, uh, it wasn't appropriate for Clancy with a multi-cat household. It works very well if you just have one or two cats uh, and you're not leaving food down. All you really have to do is uh, when it's time for them to eat, if you get home from work in the evening, you sit down on the couch, just put that plate down as far away as they're comfortable eating. And with each meal, you just a half an inch, an inch, you just bring it a little closer. It might over be a little series of months but you just get the cat used to coming closer and closer and you're just watching TV or listening to music or reading or whatever you're doing, pretty much ignoring them, not focused on them. And they get used to be coming closer and closer to you. Uh, these are the cats that currently live in my house and each one of them um, became comfortable eating right at my feet. Uh, then I would put the dish up on the couch and they'd be sitting there next to me. Again, I wasn't riveted, focused on them, just kind of ignoring them, uh, giving them treats. And gradually, each one of them, except the one up in the right hand corner, the white guy, um, they all became comfortable being petted and became more affectionate. Some of them were very, very feral when they first came. Um, the guy with the white, um, uh, he has lived with me for about six or seven years now. But as I said, it's a multi-cat household. So he has all of his cat friends. Uh, he's not really that focused on me uh, because he has his whole life with his friends. But uh, I don't push it. I let him see, you know, if he wants to become more friendly. But I have some tricks up my sleeve how to get him into a carrier when I need to get him to the vet. And I'll share those with you in, in another video. But uh, that's Clancy, the, the last one to appear there. So let's get back to his story. So apologies for the uh, quality of the video here, but I wasn't anticipating catching this wonderful sequence on a video. Clancy really liked this feather on a string on a wand toy. And uh, we became really uh, enthusiastic uh, playing. Uh, he enjoyed uh, playing at, at uh, a distance. And so after dragging around the house in different ways, I got under the covers. I alluded to this earlier that you're a lot less threatening when you're covered up to the shoulders. And uh, it worked with Andy uh, using socializing her up on a higher level. So playing with him in the bed and getting him up on the bed and I'm thinking, OK, I'm getting somewhere here. And I just reach to touch him and he bolts. But then I turn around and I realize, oh, he was coming up on the bed because he was trusting and coming to be near Swirly. And when I reached up, I ruined it. But then he went around the other side of the bed and came right up to Swirly. And for the first time ever, he allowed me to pet him. It's the classic example of the attraction to another cat short-circuiting his fight or flight response and he's perfectly distracted and happy to be petted um, uh, because of his interest in the other cat. Uh, it didn't work for him with the interactive play and it didn't work with him with the food. Uh, but this is why you w frequently want to try with the kittens. You want to try different things because you're never quite sure what will be the breakthrough item. And when Swirly wasn't there, he didn't want to be touched. It took like another six months before you could leave your hand on the food bowl. And gradually he did enjoy being petted independently of being near Swirly. But it was a very slow progression. And again, no pressure. There are no guarantees with an adult cat. You really have to be open to all options. If you are going to be the permanent lifelong caretaker, I would consider seeing how far you can go, trapping a cat, maybe confining it indoors, seeing how it goes. But you really want to have another plan in your back pocket in case the cat is absolutely miserable. Although in my experience, this is just totally anecdotal, my experience, but in 40 or 50 cats, each one of them has found 
a way, a comfort level of theirs indoors if you are willing to meet them on their level and not insist that they come to a preconceived idea where you want them to be. Thank you so much. If you've sat through the entire uh, video, you're now an expert and you could teach others. Of course, you might want to uh, watch certain sections, rewind. I know I'm taking it really fast and furious. I've lived in New York for 40 years, so I've uh, assimilated that pace. I tried not to repeat knowing that you can always freeze and go back and look at things. Uh, if you found this uh, information helpful, please do donate to Urban Cat League. We've never charged for any of our services or any of our workshops over the years, and we totally rely on individual uh, donations. So thank you very much uh, if you can support us there. We're always happy to weigh in and help you with a situation and see if we can offer some advice to get you to make some headway. Thanks again for watching and thank you so much for your work and that we share all in that goal of improving the lives of community cats everywhere. Thank you.